a lot of speculation that goes on in this genre, and too many times I think it's not backed up. So that was one of the key goals is is to show the research and uh, to bring a little bit more credibility to the genre that you know people aren't all that familiar with it. Well, you know, say it's a little bit out there, and I think you know it is like going down the uh, the rabbit hole um, because it it's really goes into areas where people haven't been before. It's like being literally, you know, taken to the land of Oz. Yeah, and, you know, when I started to write this book, you know, what I wanted to do uh, is sort of write my shortest book because I'm more into prophecy than I was into this. And this was just something that I kept kind of running across as I was doing my research on prophecy. And then as I... um, Decided as I decided to write this book to be my first book, um, I began to find links as I was opening more and more doors. And I think one of the things that uh, for people to really understand that, you know, there's a, and I have a chapter named on it, that there's nothing new under the sun. And that is one of the themes that runs right throughout the book. So as I was doing my research, I started to get... Uh, documents and books and information from the secret societies. And as it turns out, the Freemasons uh, actually have a book called uh, The Legend or the History of Freemasonry by Albert Mackey, and it was written in about the 1850s. And in this book, it has all of the legends that they have kept track of, and their legends go right back to prehistory. And they have... Uh, many of the same patriarchs that people might recognize as the patriarchs of Freemasonry, the difference being is, is that they go back to the Cain line as opposed to the Seth line. And so when, when I started looking at the background information, what was going on uh, in the sixth generation when the, when the Nephilim was created, it just dawned on me that there had to be more going on. And so at the time of Cain and Enoch and then into the sixth generation, there was this organization that began, and it's called Antediluvian Masonry. So essentially the same organization that we know of today as Freemasonry. And it derived from the seven sacred sciences that were revealed in their legends to Adam and then Adam to Seth and to Cain. And on the Cain side, they took these sacred sciences to a whole different level than what people might imagine. And what they did with that technology in sciences was to create probably a society that wasn't that far off, maybe even a little bit beyond what our society has today for technology. And so with these seven sacred sciences that were taught, they developed secret societies and mystical religions. And what they did there was two things. One is is they set up the mystical religions uh, that was uh, originally started by Enoch. And when I talk about Enoch, let's make sure everybody is understanding that this is Enoch, son of Cain, not Enoch, the holy one who walked with God and then was raptured into heaven. This is Enoch, son of Cain. And he learned the seven sacred sciences from Cain and developed mysticism with complete with initiation. And so only the elite, the powerful, the royal, the rich, the nobles would be taught this perverted kind of sciences that they took to all of these uh, great levels in, in the prehistory. And so out of the mystical religions developed the secret societies, and they're like uh, indistinguishable back then and they are today. So we had four or five groups that were kind of partnering to bring about the corruption that eventually brought on the flood. And so we have the fallen angels who created the giants that most people are familiar with. We have the descendants of Cain who produced the daughters and developed the religions. And so... From there, we have the secret societies and we have the mystical religions. And that's the partnership that was in the antediluvian world that caused the first apocalypse, that crossed the flood, have worked throughout to change, manipulate, control our history, are active today, and 
who will continue to work until they bring about the end time. Yeah, as, as, and as you move into the end time, what we're talking about is the ancient Babylon religion uh, rising again in the end time, which rose again after the flood at Babel, but actually is rooted in Enochian mysticism before the flood. It is the same religion. They would uh, prefer to take any time other than the end time to introduce the Antichrist. They have been produced, they've been trying to present the Antichrist in the antediluvian world and with uh, even very early into the post-diluvian world with Nimrod. Uh, you can look at people like uh, Nebuchadnezzar. You can look at people like Sargon. You can look at people like Alexander, Napoleon, uh, Adolf Hitler. The spirit of the Antichrist has always been there and will always be there and is trying to raise an Antichrist figure to the throne of power and, and to fulfill prophecy to actually rule the entire world. And so, yes, uh, they are have a determined plan that is prophesied in the Bible. They just have a whole different perspective on it. They're trying to do it for their reasons, not just as a natural progression. They're trying to actually bring this about and bring about the great confrontation in the end time. Yeah, as I, as I mentioned earlier, my main passion is uh, studying prophecy. And I've got you know 12 or 15 books I'd like to write. Um, but what I thought I would do is, is I thought I would take the easiest book, which I thought, well, you know, there's some interesting prophetic connections to the end time with uh, the giants from Genesis 6. And uh, just for the readers, in case they're not aware of it, there are the, uh, the, there is the prophecy that uh, Jesus made about that the end times would be like uh, the times of Noah uh, and of Sodom and Gomorrah, as Luke presents the same prophecy. And if we look to the, uh, uh, the book of Revelation, we do have the fallen angels uh, coming back and coming up out of the abyss, and we have the involvement of the demons. And so just to name a few. So I wanted to, you know, write a short book just on that connection, but the research just took me uh, down a whole bunch of different paths, and I just kept digging more and digging more and digging more. But my true passion, as I said, is, is the prophetic side, and that's why, as I found the research, um, I decided that somebody needed to connect these dots. And I think... By the time somebody is done with Chapter 98, they're going to find out that they're going to receive more information than they ever thought was possible because it's going to come at you through every chapter of the book. It doesn't stop. And I'm going to connect more dots to more organizations, more people, more history, more future events, more things that are going on right now, and connect all of those partners that we've talked about earlier, the descendants of Cain, the Nephilim descendants, the mystical religions and the secret societies and follow them through history and point out who they are today, what they're doing today to bring about the end time and then to bring about the Antichrist. And I'm also going to, to link the Antichrist to the bloodlines of the Nephilim in the book. Well, there's uh, a number of different views on who they are, which I'm sure you're quite aware of, Sean. And so... Let me just name them, and I can sort of talk about each of the categories if you want me to. But uh, the categories are, the first one is is that uh, most people, if they go to church, um, have been taught that the sons of God were uh, humans. They were the descendants of Seth, and that they weren't uh, fallen angels, and there was nothing, nothing special of them. And I can talk about how that theory has come about, uh, if you like. Uh, in, a, in a couple of minutes. And then the next theory is is that they were the, the sons of God were the fallen angels, and uh, they were the watchers, they were the rulers of the earth uh, that were uh, given portions of the earth uh, when, when the earth was created. And after the rebellion, they took out their second revenge, uh, the descendants of Adam, by bringing on the serpent seed. And then the other... Uh, thought is is that the Nephilim uh, are the same as the sons of God or the fallen angels and that there is no difference. Uh, and again, I don't buy into that one. I fall into the category of the fallen angels were the sons of God, um, were the sons of God or the Ben uh, Elohim and angels, in this case dark angels, and that uh, 
the fallen angels were different than the, the Gibberim, uh, and they were different than the Nephilim. And I do not believe that they were uh, human uh, uh, descendants of Seth uh, in the simple easiest reason for that. And again, we can get into more detail on this if you like, Sean, is, is that I don't believe the, son, uh, the sons of Seth could produce giants. It just there 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 would be so much missing in that connection that um, to me it just would not be possible. And if people want to get a quick understanding as to who the sons of God are, they can quickly go to the Book of Job that gives the most clear and concise references to the sons of God, and that would be Job one six, Job two one, and Job thirty eight verses four through seven, as I recall. And in there, it lists uh, the angels who presented themselves to God uh, in in creation, and they shouted for joy at the creation of the universe. And there's an annotation in in many of the translations um, that uh, there'll be a star and a footnote or a footnote at the bottom of the page, and it'll note that angels are Hebrew for uh, the sons of God. And these are the same sons of God in Deuteronomy 32, um, where the earth was split up. And in most translations, that'll have uh, the sons of Israel. But again, uh, if you look at the annotation that goes with it, it notes that in the uh, Masoretic text or the Septuagint, uh, it's going to be uh, the sons of God is the other translation. And then other translations of the Bible will use other gods. So again, the sons of Israel in that area could not have been around in in the days of old and generations long past when um, God divided up the boundaries amongst the sons of Israel. Israel did not come in, obviously, till well after the flood. And so I would definitely go with the translation of the sons of Israel, the sons of God, and there were the watchers and the seraphim angels that were given the authority level um, and some people will know the Watchers as Archons or Hostile Rulers and several other titles that they'll have that actually govern the, the earth before the flood. Well, uh, those, those are sort of revisionist, um, in my opinion, those are revisionist uh, ways of splitting up the word Israel. Uh, certainly El in, in ancient times was a word for, for God. Uh, but these, I mean, you have to understand um, Jacob's name was changed uh, by an angel from God to be Israel. Um, so I, I understand how they're making that, that connection, but uh, to me that's, uh, that's, that's just revisionist history using words from mostly other languages. I don't know your thoughts on that, or on Sean. I've read that many times, but I don't really put much weight into that. Yeah, we are. I mean, and Josephus was one of the the, uh, the first writers to connect the the, the Greek Titans with uh, the Nephilim out of Genesis. And for the readers who don't know who jo- Josephus was, he was a writer uh, at the time of the destruction of Jerusalem by the Romans, and he was captured. And he was uh, he was Jewish, and he was uh, an elder in the temple at the time. And they contracted him to write the complete history of uh, Israel so that it wouldn't be lost to history because uh, the, the country was going through absolute utter destruction. And so, um, I'm sorry, I forgot the question there, Sean. <laughs> uh, the men of renown, <laughs> heroes of old. Men of renown, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> I got on a bit of a tangent there and uh, forgot what the actual question was. I do so it if all we the look time. at the text, there's, um, you've got Nephilim, uh, which uh, translates uh, from NPL in, in Hebrew, which is the fallen ones. Um, and so people will confuse then the Nephilim because of that name with uh, the, the fallen angels, as I said previously. But So we've got sons of God in that writing. We've got the Nephilim. And then we've got the heroes of old and the men of renown. And if you look at the translation for the heroes of old and men of renown, those were the Gibram. And the Gibram uh, were also kings and potentates who were the heroes of old and the men of renown. And heroes would also be one of those terms in men of renown that were used in Greek mythology. So we're talking about uh, the, 
two similar types of species and in my opinion were identical. Now the difference between Nephilim and Gibberim is simply this, is, is that a human like Nimrod or an evil king could be uh, a man of renown and a hero but still be human. But a Nephilim could be both. So we have the description that they were Nephilim uh, and they were giants. Uh, as they were understood uh, by by the, uh, the ancient ancient Jewish people in most translations that those were giants, and uh, that they became the men of renown, they became the kings of of the antediluvian society, and they had partnered with the other forces that we had talked about to not only gain control but to uh, gain control of the whole world in a similar type of thing that they're, per, that they're planning for the end time. So what I'm talking about is, is they essentially had established uh, a world government and were trying to enslave the descendants of Adam. And that is exactly what they're going to be trying to do uh, in the end time. Now, if we look at other mythologies and other religions, they talk about giants. Giants are talked about on every continent and every culture and is just as common as every flood story uh, around the world, and there are over 500 flood stories, and most of them contain the story about the giants, although they're called by different names like Titans or Anunnaki and, and many other names around the world. But they were all wiped out by a flood because they had become corrupt. They are telling from a polytheist perspective from the religions that took hold with the people uh, that came from Enoch the same story but from a polytheist perspective. And so, yes, in my opinion, and if you look at how a Titan was created or an Anunnaki was created or most of these other gods around the world, it always came from a union with a god and a human female. Just as the fallen angels went to the descendants of Cain, the daughters of Cain, and created giants from that union. So we have this story being told right around the world. So when people want to talk about the various giants, whether they're in China or they're in India or they're in Australia, it doesn't matter. It's the same story. Yeah, and if you, there's, there's a lot of different uh, thoughts on this. And when people uh, take uh, what they think is the uh, measurement of the L out of the Book of Enoch, for example, um, there's speculation if, if they extrapolate those uh, numbers that uh, the giants were 300 feet tall. I don't buy that. Um, my personal thought is, is the original first generation Nephilim that had the spirit, the immortal spirit of the fallen angels is that they were somewhere between 20 and 40 feet. Um, it's not that I'm trying trying to knock what the book of Enoch says. It just It just sounds like that's a size that just makes no sense to me whatsoever. I won't rule it out, but if you look at when we do have some measurements of some giants, uh, 16 to 20 feet is sort of the, the largest that there's any documentation on. Biblically, if you look at uh, two giants that we can look at, and they were after the flood, although Og would be one that uh, is likely uh, a survivor from the antediluvian age. And again, for a lot of Bible people, they'll say, well, I thought nobody survived the flood, and I'll cover that off in the book as well. But if they did want to look at uh, a couple of references to, uh, to Og, was during the uh, conquest, and uh, we were looking at uh, two annotations with uh, uh, Joshua and his encounter with uh, Og and Sion, his brother, who also survived the flood. And that was in Joshua 12 and De Deuteronomy 3. And so in most translations, it's, it's, the bed is 13 feet long. Well, that's by measuring a cubit. Well, there was two cubits that were used in the uh, in ancient times. One was the common cubit, which is where that measurement comes from. And the common cubit is also the measurement that most people use to establish what the height of Goliath was, which is the other giant I was talking about. But the standard cubit was 18 inches, and the royal cubit is about 21 inches. So if you extrapolate the bed that Og was in, it now becomes about a 16 to 16 and a half foot bed, and uh, it makes uh, Goliath uh, about 
uh, 12 feet, almost 12 feet, just shy of it. So we're talking very, very large people. And the reason why I side on the royal cubit is, is because you need everybody needs to sort of get their heads around that when we talk about these ancient societies, the kings were the Nephilim and the descendants of those Nephilim. And so if they were royal and, and they were, then they would not have used a common cubit. They would have used a royal cubit. So uh, I would uh, definitely uh, suggest using a royal cubit measurement for any time that we're uh, using antiquarian measurements when it comes to giants. So we're talking massive uh, size to them. But these giants just weren't tall. They were broad. They were almost twice as wide uh, as the average human. And they not only were they wide, they were muscular and they were fleet of foot. So they weren't these, these uh, side so were nimble beasts. These were uh, beings that were built for war and military and uh, fleet of foot, fleet of hand, very skillful. They had longer necks. They had faces that were serpentine. Uh, they had the face of a snake to be exactly if somebody's uh, wondering what I'm getting at. And they look like that because they look just like their fathers, the seraphim angels. And so they had this long, slender, narrow face with high cheekbones. They had these slanted eyes. Um, they, uh, the Nephilim were also known to be very hairy, and their eyes also glowed. And so they would light up a room. And in fact, in many of the cultures, they were known as the shining ones, particularly in uh, the Tuatha Dé Danann mythologies and in the Sumerian and Assyrian and Babylonian mythologies. They were called the shining ones, just as El, which is a uh, uh, word that's used throughout the Middle East as a god, was a shining one. They're a little bit different. These these were beings of heaven and of earth, so they had flesh, whereas the uh, the, the gods or the fallen angels, as, as we would know them at, um, were more spirits. So they were called opalescent beings. So these were frightening beasts, and they had voices that would just echo and just rock uh, the, a room. I mean, uh, it, you know, when we hear of the, the term out of Greek mythology, you know, it echoed like the voice of uh, Atlas. Uh, it, I mean, the voices were frightening. So these were huge creatures and they were strong and they were they looked completely different in the first generations uh, as to what uh, the later uh, descendants would look like. And I would encourage people if they want to get a kind of look, uh, idea of what some of these uh, Nephilim looked like as uh, they, their bloodlines were diluted down through the ages is go to a King Tut. Uh, exhibition or look up King Tut and look for a picture of the Pharaoh Akhenaten. And if you look at that picture of Akhenaten, you're going to see a snake's face. And then it's got human qualities as well, but it is absolutely frightening and startling to look at. And I bring up Akhenaten, and I'll write about him in the book because he was one of the sort of long, most famous and the last of the Egyptian dynasty of the royal dragon bloodlines that descended back to the Nephilim. And he still had that look circa 1200, 1250 BC. If we look at uh, Genesis 6, uh, we have the Nephilim narrative that begins uh, Genesis 6, and there's nothing to separate the Nephilim narrative from the flood narrative. So it's one story. So we need, for people who think that the, the giants didn't have anything to do with uh, the cause of the flood, they were one of the direct causes of the flood. But in partnership with the other groups that we have talked about pre uh, previously with the mystical religions and the secret societies, the descendants of Cain, and being taught by the fallen angels, uh, the seven sacred sciences, and the, the other illicit knowledges that came along with it. But we also look in Genesis 6, and it says that the, the Nephilim were both before and after the flood. So... We, we need to look at that this was obviously not unexpected by God that the Nephilim weren't going to be finished with. So the question really gets to be is, is, is you know, did God fail or was this just a restart 
uh, to give the whole world a fresh new start with this pure line that we have a record of, of Noah going back to Seth um, to start the world anew. So we, we have to make uh, a, a clear distinction here that um, either the Nephilim were recreated after the flood again with a second impassioned violation against the laws of creation by the dark angels, or they somehow survived the flood. Or some people think, as you pointed out, Sean, is, is that there was some DNA either in the wives of, uh, uh, of Noah's uh, sons or some other DNA manipulation or some you know, way of uh, mixed blood that crossed uh, over the flood. I don't, I don't buy into uh, the wives having a Nephilim DNA because it makes no sense that if God would make sure Noah and uh, his sons had pure human Adamite bloodlines, why they wouldn't make sure that the wives were not the same. That, would, that makes no sense to me. So we have the two po- possible theories then is... Uh, how did they survive, either recreated or somehow survived? And if people know the flood story. It says, you know, for the most part, if you read it, read it that way, it says that everything was destroyed. Well, only what it says was destroyed is what was created by God. You know, if you want to look at that interpretation and say, okay, fallen angels through human uh, females created another species that wasn't created by God. And that would be one way of skirting around that sort of legalized version of uh, of the flood. Because, pardon me? No, I said I see. That's, that's interesting. Yeah. So I think we, you know, every every word that's in the Bible is important. And it's there, it's there for a reason. And but we're not given the details in Genesis as to how that happened or was there. And we are not given the details that there was a, a, another second recreation after the flood. But we can look at uh, Nephilim surviving the flood biblically. We have all of these giants that survived the flood, whether it was the Rephites or the Anakites or the Amalekites or the Hittites, uh, the Avites, the Amites, the Zamzamites, and on and on. There's just all of these giant nations that are around immediately after the flood, but none of them connect back to the table of nations. Only the descendants of Noah connect back to the table of nations. And even some of the later descendants, once they intermingled with the giants, their genealogies are no longer recorded. So you don't see... Uh, Nimrod's descendants being recorded and you can say the same thing uh, from Japheth's line with Gog and, and Magog and interestingly in uh, other languages uh, Gog translates as a giant um, now that doesn't mean that Gog uh, son of Japheth was a giant uh, it just means that uh, they uh, cohabitated with the, the survivors of giants so we, we have to sort of figure out how this happened and I spent a lot of time in the book giving ways that 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 happened. And so we can look at um, other mythologies and see what they say and then see how in other religions and see what that says and see how that matches up with what's in what's written in the Bible. And again, for the listeners out there, I'll measure up all of the research that I do against what it says in the Bible. So if it doesn't make sense with what it's written in Scripture, then I, I, I discard it. But if it does match up, and, and so much of it does, then we, we do have other possibilities. But we don't have an explanation in the Bible as to how these giants survive. And so if we look at, let's say, the Greek mythology, for example, and we have uh, Deculion and uh, Norea, uh, surviving the flood. Well, it sounds like an ark story. It is an ark story, except when you get into the details. So if you look at Deculian, uh, he is the son of Prometheus. Now, there were two Prometheuses. One was a god and one was a titan. And so again, when we look at prehistory, uh, whether it's titans or the Anunnaki, you can have a heavenly Anunnaki and an earthly Anunnaki, and you can have a heavenly Titan and you can have an earthly Titan. Again, the separation is, is the type of God. One's a God, one's a demigod. One's a fallen angel, one's a Nephilim. 
And so the, the the second creation from the god with human females is the lower level of, of god, which was a demigod like like a Nephilim. So even in the uh, Greek mythology, which the Gnostics like to use, um, we're seeing a recollection of giants surviving, not of humans. So if we look around the different mythologies around the world, we see giants surviving in all of those stories. There's very, very few stories of the human first survival. There are some, but there are mostly stories of the giants surviving. And if we look at the Epic of Gilgamesh, for example, that's another one. And this one is really kind of interesting because it kind of brings both of the concepts together. So in the Epic of Gilgamesh, we have several characters. We have Gilgamesh, uh, we have Ankeden, and we have Atnapishtin, which some people will recognize in other translations from the Middle East as Zayazudra. So these are the three main ones. But it's the Epic of Gilgamesh and the name Gilgamesh that most people are familiar with. And so Gilgamesh uh, was a survivor of the flood. And he survived on the ark with Apnapishtim because he was one of the relatives of Apnapishtim. I'm struggling with uh, my words tonight as well too, Sean. Um, and he is known as a demigod and as a giant. And what's interesting about Gilgamesh is, is he is mentioned by name in the book of Enoch uh, as one of the giants that was warned about the flood. Even though they knew there was nothing that they could do, they were preparing for how they were going to take their knowledge, their religion, and, of course, the survival of the giants across the, the, uh, the flood through another ark. And so Gilgamesh tells the story to Anakedon. And Akedon is created after the flood in another creation of giants to counterbalance Gilgamesh because he's such a monstrous, ruthless ruler, but they become friends. And so that plan doesn't work for, for the gods who created uh, Anakedon afterwards. And he was a demigod just like uh, Gilgamesh was. And Zayazudra or Atnapishtin was the king of the Nephilim, of, of the area that they lived in, which was likely still the same area as, as where the story came from, was Sumeria, uh, at the time of the flood. And he was the archetypical king or Nephilim, military warrior, potentate of that time. He was not this Noah-type figure. And so the three main characters in this whole story are Nephilim. And we're just in the preamble of it. So this, again, is... Uh, just another retelling from a polytheist perspective about giant survival. And so all around the world we have people running to the tops of mountains uh, to survive, all sorts of arcs. And in some areas of the Gnostic religion, they will actually have uh, the uh, the Sethites uh, from Amenka Seth, which is not the Seth of the, the biblical line. It's a special giant that was created in, in their religion. It was actually separated in a cloud and taken off the earth uh, to uh, survive the flood and then came back. Also in the uh, Greek mythology, we had the rebellion of the, uh, the Titans. And after they lost the battle, uh, the rebellious Titans were imprisoned into Tartarus. Uh, and it was a special prison. Uh, some people believe it was in the earth, but wherever it was, they escaped after a flood, and uh, they would uh, uh, they had repopulated uh, with their kind after the flood. We don't know whether it's somehow they survived the flood or there was another recreation, but we know in all accounts around the world, including the Bible, the Nephilim are back. Well, I think, uh, you know, when we look at uh, Nephilim being recreated, this is a uh, concept that's never really gone away. And we'll see it come up, especially in the secret societies and, and the other religions, that they're always trying to create the so-called new man. Uh, the same belief system, the same secret societies that created Nazism is the, the same belief system that is going to try and recreate Nephilim in the end time. And so whether or not it's by gene manipulation or other, some other form of genetics or crossbreeding uh, as what happened in, in the antediluvian times, 
uh, we're going to see some form of uh, recreation of, of a new man as the, the lore goes these days or the mythos goes these days, uh, whether or not they're giants or not, or whether or not they're created by the copulation of the fallen angels who come up out of the abyss in the end time. Um, we're not sure, but we, what we are told is it's going to be like the days of Noah. Now, when you talk about the aspect of DNA manipulation, this is not an unusual thing if you look at some of the references that come out of the other cultures again. So if we look at the creation of these, uh, these Mecca Sethites uh, that we're talking about as a special creation of another race of giants that the Gnostics believe, they were created in a cloud as well. And that suggests some sort of DNA manipulation. The centaurs were created in a cloud in Greek mm-hmm. mythology. Uh, so there's this sort of off-world DNA manipulation thing that's got a connection to what's going on with uh, the alien phenomena with hybrids and DNA manipulation and that mythos. So there's certainly a possibility of that. So whether or not we do it through ourselves, uh, whether or not the aliens are going to do it, or whether or not the uh, fallen angels are going to repopulate, we're going to see this come about again in the end time because it will be like the days of Noah. Mm-hmm. There's there's a direct relationship there, and it's uh, there may be several different versions of what people know as the uh, alien phenomena. Uh, so let me just sort of backstep a little bit to what I mean by that. So again, if we look at all of this, these things that are entertainment um, blasts us, us on a regular basis, all of this sort of brainwashing that goes on, and let's take uh, whether it's the Narnia tales or it's uh, the Lord of the Rings, they're talking about prehistory and they're talking about the legacy of the polytheist belief system. And we see all these different versions of peoples in prehistory, like little elves and hobbits and fairies and all sorts of different things that were going on in prehistory. And, you know, at the end of uh, the Lord of the Rings, when it's the time of man, you see all of these uh, species going off on a boat because now it's the time of man, which is, again, another sort of imagery of what happened at the flood, that they weren't going to be at least visible after the flood. That's their belief system. Now I'm going to start to connect this a little bit, and I'm I'm, I'm walking through this fairly quickly, but if we go to the Tuatha Dé Nan mythology, where the fairy uh, uh, allegories intermix and are part of the Tuatha Dé Nan mythology, and the Tuatha Dé Nan were... Uh, giants as well in mythology and they actually connect back to uh, descending from Atlantis and were part of the Atlantean world government uh, uh, empire which again the secret societies are are, are wanting to create the new Atlantis and again that's because they're trying to do what they've been trying to do right from the beginning so but let's talk about the Tuatha and Anan and uh, there was ten empires to it they were in in the uh, uh, they were trying. If you go into the legends um, written down by Plato, they were checked by the Athenians of the antediluvian time. Otherwise, they probably would have taken over the whole world. But they were considered the helm of world government, and they had ten divisions to that empire. And that's what they're going to set up in the end time. And so when Francis Bacon wrote the New Atlantis that we know from the modern lingo that all the secret societies and everybody use, that they're going to create the new age, the new age of Atlantis, which is the golden age of Atlantis, they're going to use the same format. So all, yes, all of this connects and all the metaphors and the allegories connect. And that's one of the reasons why it's so important to understand the uh, the history so that we can understand the language that these people are talking about today, these organizations and religions, because they're doing it right in front of us and they're telling us what they're going to do. Most people just don't make the connections. But when we talk about the fairies, there are four classifications of fairies. And I have two allegories in the book, Fairies and Dragons. Uh, and here's one aspect of the fairy uh, allegory. So in the four classifications of fairies in fairy mythology, the, the first one are the opalescent beings that came from somewhere else, from other planets or from another dimension. And those are the fallen angels. So they had wings. They are the exact descriptions of, of fallen angels and are described as the ones who rebelled with Lucifer in the rebellion. The second classification is the earthborn fairies, and that's the Nephilim. 
The third class is the daemons, which are demons. It's spelled D-A-E-M-O-N-S. That is the ghostly spirits of the Nephilim whose body died, died out, the first generation who had the immortal spirit. And then there's a classification where I'm going to come to with the, uh, with the aliens as part of the classification. Uh, and that's called the elementals. And within the elementals, there are three groups. There are the gnomes, the leprechauns, and the little people. And the gnomes have a few uh, other names like goblins uh, and trolls, and they're ugly little spindly ones, but within that group of the gnomes, there's one specific one that's called the Grey Neighbors in Scotland, and they're, they're these grey little elves. And if you look at fairy mythology uh, out of, let's say, uh, England or Celtic, they have these little grey neighbors, as the Scottish people like to talk them, that had flying machines that used to kidnap uh, young people, uh, abduct them, and then return them a fortnight later or 14 days later, and they would have done experiments on them, and they had no memory of this unless they went under hypnosis to get that information back. And so in my book, I'll actually give an example of a fairy abduction from, I think, 150, close to 200 years ago. And if you didn't know that you were reading a fairy abduction, you would think you were reading an abduction by a gray alien. Now, when we look at some of the science fiction that goes on out there, and in terms of how we're being bombarded, there were many different species in Star Wars or Star Trek, and we're we're going to see a lot of different variations of these types of species as they present this delusion to us in the end time. So again, what happened in prehistory is going to be changed for our so-called technically advanced civilization in a way that we're going to accept it. So I think that there are survivors uh, of these little people that are acting as, as the aliens, and I also believe that the demons are involved and I also believe the fallen angels are involved. And fallen angels have a changeling quality to them. Um, so they can take any shape that they want in this realm. So they could easily imitate other beings. But I think there are uh, the classifications of these other beings that uh, possibly some of them also survived from the flood. And I know that that sounds way out there for a lot of the audience. But believe me, as the book outlays things, you're going to say, and this makes some sense as we get through the book. And I think uh, when we look at some of the prophetic uh, ends of the, end, you know, prophetic passages in the Bible of the end days where we talk about um, war in heaven and we talk about uh, heavenly beings being captured with the two witnesses uh, and we talk and it prophesies that the Antichrist is trying to raise his uh, throne into the heavens. I think there's a connection there whether or not it's as we see in Star Wars or uh, Star Trek or all these other different um, science fiction ones that there's actually a galactic species that's out there uh, that's all over the universe. We don't know that, but what I do believe is, is that is going to be part of the delusion, and that's what they're going to ask us to do is to choose, as in Star Wars, for example, to uh, rebel against the oppressive uh, government, which they'll label as uh, as God and, and, and monotheism. Uh, you have to fight for your freedom, just as Lucifer and the fallen angels uh, have been rebel in, in rebellion since they revolted from God, and they're going to have us make a choice to uh, stand and fight to earn our seat at the uh, galactic table, as they'll probably describe it to us. Um, but what we do know for sure is, is that we're going to have angelic beings, whether they're aliens or angelic beings, um, they are going to be part of the mix. So you could have angels plus aliens, or you, they could just be a complete angelic deception. Uh, so, let, you know, let's, let's just talk a little bit about uh, Enoch, and uh, let me just sort of backpedal my way uh, in, in, into this. In fact, you know, one of the people that uh, uh, discovered the uh, the first Gnostic uh, uh, scriptures was the uh, descendants of uh, Robert de Bruce and uh, also did the translations on that. And 
that's no coincidence either. People are going to find in the book that everything is connected. We were talking before the break about uh, the aliens, and uh, if you look at all of the uh, science fiction that's out there, it's absolutely embedded with mystical religion, whether it's the Force, um, universal life force, or if we talk about the matrix and the religion that's in there, that's not a coincidence. And if people don't know sort of where the modern secret societies came from, it came from the descendants of the Essenes at the time of Jesus who moved to Europe after the destruction of, of uh, Jerusalem and Judah. And the Essenes were one of three uh, distinct uh, sects of the Judaic religion of that time, along with the Sadducees and the Pharisees. And the Essenes were distinctly polytheistic. And they are uh, obviously at uh, odds with uh, the monotheistic version of, of, of the Jewish religion, which uh, also produced the uh, Christian religion. And so the, the Essenes, if people want to know a reference to who you can identify them with in the Bible, is go to Ezekiel, where uh, Ezekiel is um, admonishing the people that go in, in one of the, uh, the prophecies going forward. He has this vision of these people going into the temple and uh, uh, dressed in white, and they're uh, praying to the east, to the sun, and praying to Tammuz, which is, again, one of the... Uh, the parent gods and whether or not you want to call them Osiris or Tammuz or any one of the other ones, they're all the same gods, all the same religion. Uh, So this is the religion that produced the modern secret societies from right through to the Templars, through the Freemasons and the Rosicrucians and the Skullbones and no, no, Tammuz uh, is is at the top of uh, of the pantheon. So he's, he's very much equivalent to Zeus, Okay. or Anu, or uh, Marduk, uh, so no. Um, and Nimrod, he, he, he's been transposed uh, into a godlike figure, um, more, more because he married into the giants, uh, not that he was uh, a Nephilim. He would be Gibram, as he was described, as what we talked about earlier, but he was not Nephilim, and his... Genealogy is traced from the Table of Nations. So, again, we look at that. And even the Freemasons in their legends, um, they say he was large and he was a a great hunter, but he was not a giant, even though there's lots of giants, uh, a lot of other areas that would say Nimrod was a giant. But to raise him to the top of the pantheon, no, because best case, he would have been a demigod, which I don't believe he was. So you have to understand that there's gods, there's demigods, and there's humans. And that's sort of in terms of how we separate fallen angels, uh, the giants, and and human beings. So I I would say no to that. Uh, Going back to the Essenes, they trace their religion back to the Great White Brotherhood, which, again, you can see some of these connections coming through with some of the secret societies of Heliopolis and the Egyptian religion, and they believe that Moses brought that polytheist religion with him to Israel and there is a true religion. But the Essenes also, as their most holiest book, believe in the Book of Jubilees by Enoch. And they also believe in the fallen angels and the knowledge that was taught to them. And so they are a direct connection from about 2,000 years ago to prehistory to the modern history, and they're a very important sort of intersection in how all of these things come together. They would even, the Essenes would even, uh, they would not give up the names of the fallen angels that they worshipped even upon death, and they swore an oath accordingly. And so when we go back into prehistory, now we need to understand when we're talking about Enoch, there are several books of Enoch, but we need to understand there are two Enochs. One is the descendant of Seth, and the other is the descendant of Cain. Enoch is the first son of Cain and the first one that learned the knowledge and started the Enochian mysticism that the Essenes and all polytheism is based on and the religion that crossed the flood and was spread to all the four corners of the earth. And so we have several names uh, in, in the lineages that are very much identical, whether or not it's Enoch or it's Lamech. 
And so we have to be very, very careful not to confuse the two. And that's also why I go back to one of the rules that I like to do you know, when I'm doing research from non-biblical sources is if it doesn't match up perfectly with what the Bible says, I, I become very, very skeptical. I can I can appreciate the bias with the information, but if it's just totally in opposite positioning of what the Bible says, then it's it, it's it's misinformation and, and it's a deception. So there are several books of Enoch, like Enoch, Book of John, it's the first book of Enoch, second book of Enoch, that I think matches up extraordinarily well with the Bible and Old Testament accounts. And books like the Book of Jude are even quote from the Book of Enoch. But the Book of Jubilees is a whole different ballgame. And, and I know there will be some people who disagree with me on this, but it is so unaligned with Genesis and with the stories that they're talking, it is totally aligned with what other religions and other mythologies say. I'm very skeptical of the Book of Jubilee. So be very careful just because it's a book of Enoch that it's a book of what I would call the Holy Enoch or the Saintly Enoch. It could be Enoch the Evil, as I call him in, in, uh, in my book. And it is from the book's uh, it is from the knowledge of Enoch that he learns from Cain that he that he delivers to his descendants that we see the rise of the secret societies and we see the rise of mysticism and we see the rise of the application of the technology to create things like the pyramids as they like to claim. I'm not claiming they built the pyramid. I know there's a lot of speculation on that. What I do and what I do in my book is I let them speak for themselves, but they believe they created the pyramids. That's interesting. The fact that you talk about the saintly Enoch and an evil Enoch and the fact that there were two of them, uh, I had heard that before, but I, I, the way you break it down and you talk about it just blew me away. Now, there were two Lamechs as well, was there not? Yes, there were two Lamechs, one from each line. And so it's easy to intermix the two lines and it's easy to mix the intermix the, uh, the records of, of both branches. And even the other names in both lines, they're so similar. It is crazy how, how similar in pronunciation that those names are. And what the polytheist belief is and, and the ancient Mason belief is and the modern Freemasonry belief is, is is that the monotheists, the Sethites, they contrived their line, that they tried to uh, take away the titles in the royal bloodlines and, and the legacy and duplicated the names in, in, in falsely documenting their history. And uh, I would suggest that it's more clear that the other side has been trying to intermix their history with ours. And, if, and they even say that in, with inside the secret societies today. They feared the persecution of the Catholic Church. So as the modern documents came up, they would say, well, no, it's not the evil Enoch that is our patriarch. It's the uh, ecclesiastic or the holy Enoch. It's not the evil Lamech. It's the good Lamech. Trouble is, though, is they also have people like Nama, um, and they have... Jabal and Jubal and Tubal Cain. And Tubal Cain is an artificer of the highest degree in Freemasonry legendary that they relate themselves to. And even some of those legends, they actually say that, hey, you know, they were trying to confuse the, the lineages so that they, they wouldn't have uh, the persecution in modern times. So it's very clear that uh, people have to be very, very careful when they're looking at the names and making sure they're applying them, the stories and the information to uh, the, the proper lineage. And, you know, we see so much in prehistory uh, in, in Genesis account that there's more going on than um, what is, is, is told to us. And, you know, we do have mention of, uh, you know, Tubal Cain, and, uh, but we're not really told as to what degree people like Jubal and Nama took their skills to. But the four names uh, that are mentioned uh, in the Bible, Tubal, Nama, Jubal, and Jubal, um, they are very, very important in polytheist prehistory. And Nama, actually, in the Gnostic religion, is believed to be 
the original form of Norea. Norea has several different forms in the, in the Greek and Gnostic uh, scriptures that are out there. But to be the same person, Norea Nama, and Nama is believed in their belief system to have married a giant. And so if we look at what Freemasonry talks about in terms of what uh, these four people did, because this is not all that clear in, in the Bible, um, Josephus does give us a little bit more information, but um, Jabal was actually uh, the one who rejuvenated Masonry in his generation. And that's the fifth science of geometry. And Jabal uh, invented music, which uh, became uh, part of Pythagoras' uh, mysticism after the flood. Uh, Nama is a, was accredited with weaving. In another account, she's uh, accredited with teaching people how to read. And, uh, of course, Tubal Cain was a, a, a smith and has a, a name um, that's uh, hyphenated uh, back to his father, um, who was also a smith. And uh, so he's accredited with inventing tools and weapons and was a master craftsman and was a military leader and known in uh, their, their um, understanding of, of uh, history in the Sumerian language as Tubal Kin. Um, so if we look at all of the things that uh, these uh, the sons of Lamech and the one daughter, they started this whole sort of, uh, I, I guess what has happened is is the application of the science is uh, kind of slowed, but, but these four uh, reinvigorated it. And uh, for people who aren't familiar with the seven sacred sciences um, that I'm talking about, maybe, maybe I should quickly list them for the people. Uh, they sound a, a little bit... Um, simplistic but it's actually what you know society is built on and again it's the level that they took these sciences to so there was uh, grammar for the molding of minds through reading which we talked about uh, rhetoric which is the art of persuasion uh, dialectics which is a discerning of falsehoods and all of this combined into what people will really understand today what was a collective new science that we understand as philosophy which is all part of the religion. So when think, people think that philosophy is secular, it is religious-based. It's all part of this whole mysticism. Then there was arithmetic, so all sorts of math. There was geometry, which included alchemy and masonry and building and angles. And there's music, and then there's astronomy. So those are the seven sciences that were taught uh, to the descendants of Cain and taken to whole new levels by uh, the sons of Lamech. And they also had additional knowledge that the seven uh, ruling archons were providing that was absolutely illegal and provided to them in, in, in the Antiluvian age. In terms of that, the Bible has been, been manipulated. Um, I'm, not, I'm not convinced that um, a lot of the wording has been manipulated in the Bible. I know there's um, some things going on today as some of the uh, publishers of certain types of Bibles are starting to change uh, the wording. Um, but, you know, there are records that go back right through to 700 B.C. that where they can see records as being essentially identical to how they were written then as to how they're written today. There are, you know, as they do translations into other languages, there's a couple of possible meanings that can go with it. So I like to... I have a number of Bibles, um, so and and different translations of the Bibles, but I, I, I tend to lean on the ones that will give the other possible translations. So that if I'm not quite sure what it means, it could mean that. Does it mean? Does it match up then with the rest of the Bible? When I talk about that, uh, it is in there uh, specifically and for a reason. Uh, I don't think the Word of God is 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 written in, in a happenstance sort of way. And I think we need to respect what it says. It will, at times, I think people will say that it might contradict uh, itself. I don't believe the Bible ever contradicts itself. I believe what the Bible does is add additional information as to what may have been given before and continues to build on those, those precepts. But I, I don't believe that it is in contradiction. 
Uh, I think uh, unless you can speak uh, uh, perfect ancient languages, um, then it, you're going to have to rely on, uh, you know, modern uh, translations. Just be careful that there are a few out there today that are that are starting to change uh, some of the wording. But, you know, we're reading the King, King James Version can be very difficult for, for a lot of people. So um, I don't think it's, uh, I, you know, I think people should pick the version that they're most comfortable with. But, you know, you should have other copies so that you can compare what's written in that one to a, 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 another copy. If we talk about things like the, the Council of Nicaea, they didn't change what was written. They just decided to select what would be in that canon and what would not be. Just as we came around around the 14 or 1500, some of the Apocrypha was also eliminated as well. So and if you look at the Catholic Bible, um, you'll notice, you know, being raised Catholic, John, that they have several other books that most of the translations that people use today uh, don't have whether it's the Book of Maccabees or the Book of Ezra or the Book of Wisdom. Um, so there are copies, uh, you know, there are uh, even testaments today that a lot of Protestants aren't all that familiar with. And I know, and I use some of, uh, some quotes out of those books in, as reference in my book, and I, and I do have readers coming and say, well, I'm not familiar with this book. It's not in the Bible. Well, it is. It's just there's, there's another Bible that uh, has other books in it. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that uh, yeah, it's not accurate. Um, it, yes, again, it lines up. So, uh, again, I, I test what it says and how it lines up, what it says everywhere else as to whether or not it's legitimate or not. So, yeah, I'm not, I'm not one of those uh, that would get uh, a newer edition of some Bibles. I, you know, one that I like to rely on, it, actually it's a 1973 edition, so it's before any of this political correctness that's going on today. According to uh, the Freemasonry, uh, it was taught to uh, Adam while he was still in Eden, and so the uh, and and that Adam was uh, you know an adept at these sciences and was uh, um, an active practitioner of them after he left Eden. But their belief is he was taught in Eden, so it either. There, that did happen, which the Bible didn't talk about, or the second part where they'll talk about where this knowledge came from um, is in the Eden incident um, of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And so for most Christians and monotheists, they'll look at that as, as well, it's just good and it's evil and they're no longer innocent. But that's not exactly what the serpent says or Lucifer says um, when he's talking to uh, Eve about eating the fruit. What he's talking about is having her eyes open to the knowledge of good and evil, that they could become like gods because God was, in their belief system, holding um, humans back from becoming godlike. And so learning of the knowledge of good and evil uh, is one of the sort of constitutive bases of the knowledge cult of the religion. And I'm going to come back to it, a specific name on that in a second. So obviously immortality uh, is part of godhood, uh, the ability to have rational judgment uh, and to discipline the knowledge that uh, the gods have is, is the other aspects that they believe in. So they believe that it wasn't the tree of good and evil it's the tree of gnosis, the tree of knowledge, in that they received all of this knowledge instantly once they ate of the of the tree of, of gnosis. And, of course, gnosis is, is uh, the basis for the Gnostic religion because it's a knowledge cult polytheist religion. And that's part of how they're going to climb the ziggurats through their initiation levels to become like God. That is what Lucifer was promising Adam and Eve, that they would be awakened to this knowledge and they would be like gods. So that is probably more likely from a biblical perspective where they would have received this knowledge. But again, we know that you know Adam was probably taught a lot of things by God in the Garden of Eden, and as long as he was going to use them in a good way, that was fine. 
But after the Eden incident, now we have them expelled from Eden, and we have Cain, and we have Abel, and then later we have Seth, and of course Abel is murdered by uh, Cain, and Cain is taught all of this knowledge from Adam, and now he takes it a whole different direction so that they no longer honor the one God of the universe, which is part of the mysticism and part of the problem that caused the flood. And they're going to do everything to honor his new God, Lucifer, who freed them and gave them the knowledge. And they start to pervert it and they start to do it in ways that God did not want the knowledge used. So, you know, I know we get a bad rap as monotheists and Christians that were anti um knowledge i don't believe that's the case we're we're just anti using knowledge and science in ways that um are evil in ways that are contrary to how god wants us to do it um their opinion is is that they want to use it any way they want and they don't really care what god has to say about it and the fallen angels use humans and the descendants of nephilim to manipulate them because they know the power of God, and uh, they'll let uh, people who don't know uh, the full power of God do the things for them. It is, and it, it, they, they look at humans like cattle. Uh, we are mundane. Um, we have no purpose other than to serve them or do work for them, and if there's too many of us, to get rid of them. You know, the Georgia... Stones uh, certainly testifies to a Rosicrucian belief, as the theory goes, who put those Georgia stones up, that, you know, they want to take the population down to to a level. Similar to what happened in prehistory where in Sumeria uh, and in those legends that the people became too noisy, so we were wiped from the face of the earth with the flood. That's a kind of a cold sort of thought, but I think we need to understand that these, these organizations, they... They believe they have the bloodlines in the in at let me back up a, a step. The people who lead these organizations, the puppet masters so to speak, the ones pulling the strings of the people at the lower levels, they actually believe they are the descendants of Nephilim. And so they believe they are a superior human being and therefore the average human who they would call mundane is one of their favorite words. Uh, they are like cattle. And uh, they are prepared to slaughter us en masse. We are, uh, you know, if we can be useful to them, fine. If not, they'll certainly keep our numbers in check. And I think we're going to see a holocaust of unbelievable proportions when we get into the end time. And, of course, that's also what uh, Revelation predicts is two major holocausts, one by Babylon, one by the Antichrist. But that's part of their belief system. And through the book, I will talk about these bloodlines, not only from the royal bloodlines, but the noble bloodlines, and who actually organizes these secret societies. And once you understand that they believe that they have the bloodlines and something that they would call the gene of ISIS, um, which they believe is the, the DNA difference that came from Nephilim, uh, the spark of the d- divine. They believe that uh, the spark is, is, has been disseminated all over the earth. And if they can bring about world government, they can unite the spark of the divine. And when that happens, this harmonic convergence, as you'll hear from the New Age uh, religion, which again is just an extension of theosophy, which is Gnosticism, which goes back to all of these other ancient religions, which are the same religion. They're talking about the spark of the divine. That's the thousand points of light allegory that globalists like to use. And they use it, and of course, George Bush Sr. used in one of his speeches. They don't, they use these terms all of the time, but they're talking about that. They believe they have a different breeding than the average human. Now, there's different levels of bloodlines in terms of purity, but all of them, if they become illuminated and higher to go into the Rosicrucians and even higher than that, you have to have more pure bloodlines. Well, you know, obviously there's a lot of speculation on the RH negative bloodlines, and there's a lot of speculation that a lot of the royal families are heavily dominated with the RH negative bloodline, and that's the bloodline of the Nephilim, and that the RH negative 
somehow was interjected in the human race that is foreign to our bloodline. I don't know whether that, that's true. Certainly the people who have those royal bloodlines aren't exactly lining up to let us uh, test uh, their bloodline to see whether that's actually the case. But it, it does make sense. Uh, from a speculative perspective that they would have something different either in their genes or in their blood that would trace them back to the Nephilim to back up their belief system. Because here's what people don't understand. These families, whether they're royals or closely related to the royals or the ones in, in the background that people may not know who the names are, they trace their genealogies back. They trace them all the way back through history. We trace them all the way back through prehistory, and they trace them, and they have these genealogies taking them back to the Nephilim. So th- whether or not that's a lie, or that, and it's just a belief, or it's fact, that's what they believe, and that's what's important. Exactly. It's, it's not whether or not we want to discount that that's actually true. That, that's actually irrelevant. It's what they believe and what they're trying to bring about. And if we look at royal dynasties and and noble families, they all intermarry to keep their bloodlines pure. Now, they have to bring in outside bloodlines at times to to prevent too many genetic diseases and things, but they have, throughout history, tried to keep the bloodlines uh, as pure and as intact as possible. And it continues today. You know, there is a... an article that I, I read that not that long ago that all of the U.S. presidents uh, can trace their genealogy back to the Plantagenet dynasty. And people don't know who the Plantagenet dynasty is. is that's like uh, the, the dynasty of King Richard um, uh, after uh, they inherited the, uh, uh, the name out of France through the intermarriages there. Um, and the Plantagenet, through... Um, intermarriage actually got the uh, the English uh, monarchy, but that's not unusual in how these families move around. But I understand they're all connected. And if these pseudo blue bloods in the United States, who are less pure bloodlines, are trying to connect themselves back to the Plantagenet, and in the book I'll connect the Plantagenet back and forth all the way through, so people can see how those bloodlines go forward. There's something to it. And it continues to this day that they intermarry. You know, we you know, I'm from Canada. People aren't aware of that. And we just elected a new prime minister, Justin Trudeau. Well, his, he had a father named Pierre Trudeau who was a member of the Club of Rome. And what's interesting about Pierre Trudeau is is that in the Club of Rome is, is that they divided the world up in the late 60s and early 70s that they were going to create world government and create 10 distinct regions or trading blocks or spheres of influence or economic zones, whatever you want to call it, but divide them into 10 just like Atlantis was so that they can bring about the new Atlantis. And so now when when Pierre was uh, elected prime minister in 1968, he was unmarried. So he married somebody, uh, and who was that? Well, it was a Sinclair. And if people don't know who the Sinclairs are, they're the ones who started Freemasonry after Templarism fall, uh, fell and protected them along with uh, King Bruce from uh, the Catholic Inquisition to totally wipe them from the, from the face of the earth. So all of this is, is connected, and it demonstrates that they're still intermarrying for the, uh, the bloodlines today. So they believe it. Great, Sean. Thank you. Hi, it's Alan calling in. Hi, Gary. How are you? Good. And yourself? Great. Thank you so much. I really appreciate how you uh, started going in and talking about uh, the different uh, art of ed- rhetoric. And I find that really interesting. And about the Shining Ones, because the Shining Ones are always mentioned in Freemasonry. And like you mentioned, how it levels right up to Rosicrucianism. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and the other interesting thing it gets into, you just were uh, getting off the topic about the uh, spark of divine or divine spark. Mm-hmm. Billy Graham talked about that as well, the fifth dimension man back in the mm-hmm. 50s there. Yep. And as we see now, everybody's starting to get into this, we've got to progress, now we can evolve into the higher consciousness. The kingdom, so to speak, is at hand. And they have to have world, 
and they have to have world government to make that happen in their belief system. Everybody's got to be united under one government and one religion mm-hmm. to make that right. happen. And, and that kind of all went back. Yeah. That's where we're getting science yeah. and scientism. And if I look, if we look at chakras, like I was trying to uh, study some of these speakers' uh, ufology, and all of a sudden they get into consciousness, raising their frequency, do your chakras. And I don't know if I'm correct or not, but the chakras is the alignment of planets. Do you know mm-hmm. anything about that, way? Yes. Well, I mean, it's, it's the whole... It, you have to understand that there's only two religions out there. There's only possibly three belief systems. There's one that's, that's monotheistic, and the other one is polytheistic. And the polytheistic, whether or not it's Eastern religion or it's New Age, that is one religion. It doesn't matter whether it was the ancient Aztec religion or the Toltec religion. It doesn't matter which religion. You, it's the same religion. And so all of this is talked about in all of those different religions. They have different terms and different names, but uh, all of it has to do with the planets. And, and, and it also brings in the things like the Zodiac as well. The planets in their belief system were named after the fallen angels and gods in that they have an impact on our destiny. And that's where the fate comes from. And fate is part of the fairy uh, allegory that we talked about earlier. So all of this goes back to the ancient belief system. I was also uh, interested uh, to note uh, when you're talking about Freemasonry that uh, uh, about light and knowledge, and light is a key uh-huh. allegory in Freemasonry and in, in Gnosticism and all of the knowledge cults. Um, oh, huge. And the Freemasonry people believe there are the children of light, and that they, they are the disciples of light. And uh, right. so they believe they believe that uh, they have the true knowledge, and that we are the evil ones. So they do a complete role reversal of who monotheists are, who we believe we are to what they think they are. They think we're the evil ones. They think we are the, the oppressors just as we think that of them. So it's, it's really quite interesting when you get into these different allegories of uh, each, each of the two religions. But I have to underline that, you know, if you look at the, the religions and follow their history, they all go back to the same religion. They do. And your book uh, really um, expands on so many areas and, that's really interesting how you talked about uh, Pierre Elliott Trudeau going back to the Sinclair family, which you bring out in your book, yeah. prior to uh, Sion and, and so forth, and King Arthur. It just it just covers so much. Anyways, uh, thank you very much for letting me have a chat there. Well, if it's the same story that I'm thinking of, is is that uh, you know. Um, I, I just recently retired at the end of the year, so I, uh, I was working all the time. I was doing this research, and I used to fly to a lot of locations. And I used to do a lot of work and a lot of reading on planes and, and try and get things done. Uh, and uh, I was sitting beside a, an elderly gentleman. He must have been in 70s, maybe older. Uh, and he noticed one of the uh, the books I was reading, and he started asking me a few questions about that. And... Uh, as it turns out, he was a 33-degree uh, illuminated Freemason of the Scottish Rite. And uh, so then I started asking him some questions, and uh, what he said was, well, if you can um, figure out what this symbol means on my ring that I'm wearing, uh, I'll answer you know, anything that you want to ask. And so he has this ring, and it's got this blue background on it. And in the center of the ring, there's a small line um, and then on both sides there's two dots and so I'm going hmm, I'm not real sure about that can I have some time to think about it and he says yeah he says take all the time in, in, in the world that you want and he kind of laughs and you know he continues uh, doing his own reading and uh, so I come back and I said you know I'm not real sure what it is but maybe maybe I'll take a you know a stab in the dark I said that line, not sure what that is. It, it, it could be a stick or it could be a cane. And uh, I said those two dots, there's two of them, could be balls. Um, I said the only way I could put that together would be two, as in the two dots. The dots as being balls and the stick as being cane. I said that's the only thing I can think of would be two ball cane. 
He says, well, that's absolutely correct. I'm surprised you were able to to connect that sort of allegory. So he says, so go ask the questions that you want. So I got a, a couple of quick questions, and he basically said, you're asking questions I am just not permitted to answer, and I will not answer. So he kind of shut me down. But I think too, it's an interesting story just because uh, – uh, he was there, and uh, you know, he showed me the ring. He claimed to be a 33 degree uh, adept, and he took a lot of interest in what I was reading. And he, he said, you know, there's a lot more to learn. Keep, keep learning it. Um, so he said, I can't, I can't ask. You know, you want to ask me simple little questions, you can ask me that. But the types of questions you're asking, I'm just not permitted to, to answer.